I'd well, like to welcome everybody to the seminar today. This is the first of our uh, seminars for the semester. And pretty much every week from here forward uh, on uh, Wednesdays at 3 o'clock. Uh, everybody got the memo while you're here at 3 o'clock. Uh, we're also um, expecting that on some uh, Wednesday afternoons at 4 o'clock, uh, we'll follow this event probably with a happy hour or something like that, which we've arranged some things to make that more convenient. So anyway, we will have a seminar next week. It'll be uh, Dr. Sarah Knight from the University of Auckland. And, uh, but today, uh, we're going to hear a seminar from someone who probably really needs no introduction. Uh, undoubtedly, you all know Dr. Paul Liesnam, who's our the, uh, new chair for ENST. And uh, last year, when all the interview stuff was going on, Paul was actually officially on sabbatical. Is that right? Yeah. And so, is this about your sabbatical? No. So he's not going to report about his sabbatical today. Uh, but he has some other interesting things to share with us about Asian tiger mosquitoes. And even as a soils guy, I know that's 80s albopictus. Right? See what I've learned from Dr. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Paul, glad to hear from you today. Great. Thanks, Marty. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Marty. I was intending to give a seminar this semester uh, on my sabbatical work, but that's still in progress. So maybe, um, maybe in the spring or next year, I'll get to that. But what also occupied my time last semester was helping my graduate student, Aubrey Tingler, shown here, finish up her master's uh, degree in the Mies program. And it was a fun project that we did in University Park, Maryland, close by. So I thought it was worth reporting it here uh, because I think all of you might enjoy it. So uh, Aubrey sends her apologies. Ideally, I would have Aubrey up here telling you about the work that she did, but she's busy as a policy analyst at uh, NOAA's Office of Coastal Management, I think. Um, this was after a very successful time in the Mies program where she was also a Sea Grant Fellow. Um, and Aubrey worked with me on an NSF uh, project, which was uh, a large project, but a part of that involved mosquitoes and management and green space. And so I'll be reporting on that today. Before I get into Aubrey's work, I just want to remind us a little bit about mosquitoes in the United States, because I think it is a fun history. And um, of course, this country has a really long history of mosquito-borne risks, right? Today, we may not think that. Generally, our lives aren't really affected by mosquitoes too severely, um, but this country's had a long history. And here I'm showing you malarial risk in the US in the 1850s. And as you can see, a lot of the risk was in the Southern United States, but the rates of malaria were really, really high. Um, and of course, during the Civil War, uh, there were reported to be well over a million cases of malaria in the Union Army. Uh, so it was very severe. It certainly affected the effectiveness of the Union Army and probably more so the Confederate Army, but we don't have very good records for the Confederates. And then of course, after the Civil War, even better maps were, um, I'm going to move this. Now, let's see if I remember high play. Uh, even better maps were um, developed to, to map malarial deaths. And here I'm showing you one of those maps. Again, the darker red areas show greater malarial deaths. And these are concentrated in the south. And of course, it was in 1897 when Major Ronald Ross discovered that malaria was transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. And that really set about systematic mosquito control, right? At the time, malaria, of course, was endemic in the United States. And it also led to some pretty successful outcomes for this country and elsewhere. One of those was the completion of the Panama Canal by the Americans after the French had failed miserably by being struck down by uh, successive malarial outbreaks. Of 
course, if we move on, all right. In addition to malaria, there were some other tropical diseases which posed a risk to the United States, and yellow fever was one of them. And yellow fever is interesting because even though it was a tropical disease transmitted by the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti shown here on the left, um, it even had a severe impact in temperate cities up the east coast. So here I'm just showing you numbers of um, deaths in some major East Coast cities that we're all familiar with between eight, uh, 1693 and 1905. And this was because trade ships came up from the Caribbean uh, with sugar and rum, and the mosquito hitchhiked on those trade ships. And during summertime, there were yellow fever um, outbreaks in all of these cities that led to pretty severe death rates. Were they aware at the time that the ships were the vector? Uh, they were. They, they gradually became aware, certainly after Ronald Ross showed that Anopheles mosquitoes transmitted malaria, then other pathogenic agents uh, like yellow fever were starting to be traced to mosquitoes. All right. Okay, so I think what these history lessons may suggest is um, what can we learn from these successes, right? So yellow fever and malaria are no longer uh, epidemic in the continental United States. They no longer have a severe public health threat. And I would suggest that really public education really worked in their control, right? There were certainly technological advances, you know, window screening and residential air conditioning units that came about in the 1950s enabled humans to retreat from their front porch inside and broke the mosquito human contact which played a large part in eliminating malaria uh, but we also set about reducing mosquito populations in and around where we lived and that certainly involved a large public uh, education outreach program and one example of some of the multiple public service films that came out during the earlier 20th century was this one by Disney, The Wind Scourge, which you can find on the internet. It's a nine minute clip showing, I think these are the seven dwarfs, right? <laughs> Doing various mosquito control actions, right? <laughs> Cleaning up containers and backyards, creating um, draining ditches, putting screens on rain barrels. This is chopping vegetation, I think cattail around wetlands to help fish prey upon mosquitoes, and then administering a variety of chemicals to our wetland areas, <laughs> which was very effective. This is uh, gasoline. If you just want to pour that on wetted areas, that will prevent the mosquito larvae from coming to the surface and breathing. And this is Paris Green, which is an arsenic-based chemical, which was used quite regularly. So these were very effective at controlling mosquito populations. They also had a few non-target impacts, but they were effective at their job. And of course, uh, the CDC was established in 1946 with the mission to eradicate malaria. And within five years, by 1951, they had done that in the United States by using a lot of these techniques driven by effective public education. So with that in mind, I kind of wanted to turn to a mosquito threat today and focus on a particular mosquito called the Asian tiger mosquito or the tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, which is probably the most problematic mosquito in urban Maryland today. 90% of all the mosquito-related complaints to the Maryland Department of Agriculture are due to this particular species. It invaded the continental United States in the mid-1980s and used tires in uh, Houston, Texas. And really since then, it spread rapidly across the eastern part of the country. 
More recently, it has been found in Southern California. And really since this map, it's made its way up California. Uh, so invasive Asian tiger mosquito, which I'll just denote as ATM in my slides. Now they develop in small ground level water holder containers that are really common in residential areas. And agency led mosquito management really is largely ineffective at controlling it. In order to reach hot spots of these mosquitoes in residential backyards, you really need repeated, very intensive uh, spraying, systematic spraying regimes, usually of adulticides. Right, so uh, that is often um, unwanted, uh, even if it is effective at controlling Asian tiger mosquito. Increasingly, residents, certainly around this area, don't want to see um, trucks spraying mosquito sites. And there's also concerns about non-target organisms as well. Uh, commercial mosquito control can be costly, uh, localized, and it's sporadic. This is like Mosquito Joe, an American pest. And there's increased risks of insecticide resistant uh, in larger populations when control is disorganized and inefficient. So with that, communities often have very limited options at controlling the species. So before I go on, I do want to provide a disclaimer uh, so my talk won't be about West Nile virus or other diseases, right? The Asian tiger mosquito does transmit West Nile virus, uh, but that's not going to be the focus of this talk. And certainly incidence of West Nile virus is not nearly at the levels as past mosquito-borne pathogen threats um, that I've just talked about. And this talk is not about mosquitoes in stormwater ponds or non-residential landscapes, and I'll mainly just focus on residential communities. So just to give you an idea of the mosquito life cycle, which you're all probably quite familiar with, we have adults that find these little bodies of water, they lay eggs. With regards to the Asian tiger mosquito, the female will lay eggs just above the waterline when it rains and floods those eggs will be inundated with water the eggs will hatch into larvae which develop through four instars into a pupil stage which then emerges into an adult so really these are largely two main responses that communities and individual residents can do to try and control the asian tiger mosquito and these are well communicated by the cdc and the EPA. The first one is to protect the family, right? Use insect repellent, wear long sleeve shirts and pants, and take steps to control mosquitoes indoors and outdoors with window screening and air conditioning. And of course, the CDC and the EPA have really good information on all a range of EPA registered insect repellents. The second main response is targeting the source, right? Mosquitoes need water in order to breed and develop. And so around residential areas, really try and avoid uh, or try and minimize all the little sources of water that could be a place where the Asian tiger mosquito could breed. So these can include uh, yard care containers, buckets here that fill up with water, could be rain barrels, which may not have sufficient screening on them. Could be disconnected downspouts, which are very good in terms of stormwater management, uh, which can sometimes hold mosquitoes in these black corrugated plastic pipes. Various sorts of trash, and of course, even useful containers that may fill up with water like a recycling bin here can produce lots and lots of adults. So I kind of want to spend most of my time today talking about an effort of mosquito control and public outreach in University Park, Maryland, uh, which is very close to campus, as you all know. Uh, so University Park was really ahead of the game in terms of resident-based mosquito control. And in uh, 2012, uh, some very motivated residents, no, I want to counsel 
started a program or lobbied the town council to provide no. money to start a program that involved pretty extensive resident education focused around this idea he of fight seen time. Edward, he has it involved um, distributing pamphlets and other media that advised residents to minimize mosquito habitat in the backyards and how to protect themselves, uh, as well as conducting yard inspections, maybe to provide some advice uh, to residents on how to better control mosquitoes, as well as adult surveillance, surveillance to try and identify hotspots of mosquitoes within the town. And these were largely driven by interns paid by the town council, and many of which uh, went through my lab and some other labs here at the University of Maryland. Now, University Park, uh, if you weren't, uh, wasn't aware, is of course in Prince George's County. Uh, it's quite a small town of only about a thousand households, about two and a half thousand residents. Um, it's a relatively affluent community, um, median household income, about twice that, the national average. Uh, it's predominantly non-Hispanic white uh, with some Hispanic, Black and Asian um, members of the community. And by 2016, they're really ready to level up their mosquito control. And they wanted to do this using lethal overtraps. So lethal overtraps have been used in a number of studies and by a number of communities to control container utilizing mosquitoes like the Asian tiger mosquito and a closely related species, Aedes aegypti, which was the yellow fever mosquito I talked about just a few minutes ago. And much of the most convincing evidence uh, that they were comes from uh, a series of large studies in Puerto Rico in which uh, these lethal overtraps were used. And if over 80% of households utilized them, there were measurable decreases in the number of dolts flying around biting people. So lethal overtraps can come in various sizes, but they essentially function the same way. There's a bucket of water, which is usually baited with a nutrient source which uh, produces volatiles, which are attractive to the mosquitoes. Uh, the females then will fly into the bucket to lay her eggs. Access to the water is usually restricted by a screen, uh, or the water is also uh, has a toxicant added to it, like BTI, uh, and the female cannot exit the bucket. Uh, there may also be, you might see a sticky card here that the female may stick onto and eventually she'll die on that sticky card. So uh, these are a particularly effective way of controlling mosquitoes and they've been shown to work. And so uh, I just wanted to point out that the trap that the University Park residents were wanting to use was this GAT trap. It should read gravid 80s trap, right? Gravid denoting um, a female with eggs to lay. So the gravid trap is produced by a German firm called Biogenes, um, but they are distributed widely in the United States. We think of them as a passive trap in that they don't need a power source. They don't need a battery or to plug into a power outlet to work. And they're reasonably affordable. So you can pick up two of these traps uh, for about $85 on Amazon, or you can pick up a bunch of 12 for about $400, right? So significantly less than some motorized traps on the market. And they really kill the females and their eggs. So we think of them as a double kill trap and they act as sinks. And their effectiveness really depends upon source reduction as well. So if you eliminate other sources of water that females can utilize, then there's more likelihood that the female will utilize this trap. Uh, and they require some ma monthly maintenance, right? So here, I've just got a cross section of a trap here. So every month, this water usually needs to be re replaced, uh, it needs to be baited. Um, the sticky card here, which is usually uh, deployed within the trap will need to be replaced every month, but relatively little maintenance. And you can place them 
uh, in your yard. It's advised to put one in the backyard, one in the front yard. Um, so it's a relatively affordable, easy way of mosquito control. So when I talked about University Park really leveling up their mosquito control, they wanted to focus around using these gat traps. And it was a resident citizen-led program, which my collaborator, Dina Fonseca, Dina is actually a professor at Rutgers University. She actually lives in Bethesda, Maryland, so I think she's got the worst commute in the world, driving from Bethesda to uh, Rutgers University uh, three times a week. Um, and she termed this effort as Citizen Act, Citizen Action Through Science. Essentially, Dina acted as an expert advisor, but really the program was led by citizens. So uh, University Park is a sustainability committee. The sustainability committee organized for over a thousand GAT traps to be purchased directly from the manufacturer. This was back in 2016. They got a bit of a discount. They developed a website for trap distribution. They developed step-by-step -step brochures on how to set up the trap. And then they held demonstration and distribution events like this. And this, I think, is in a town hall, University Park. And then through the summer of 2017, they held a number of community events to really promote this trap. There are town hall events, sustainability webinars, 4th of uh, July parade. Um, and in addition to that, they're able to recruit volunteer block captains, right, to pester their neighbors to buy these traps. So it really was a citizen-led program. And the million dollar question was, did it work? So Dina was able to assess whether or not it worked during the summer of 2017. And she did this by uh, putting out professional traps that focused on capturing adult females that are flying around looking for a blood meal. So here I'm just showing a map of University Park, uh, showing each of the parcels. So we've got Route 1 down here on the right. I think this is Riverdale Road or East West Highway, Adelphi Road up here. In the middle, there's a creek that runs through University Park and Green Space. And she had 18 sites where she placed one of these professional traps that would capture adults that are flying around looking for a blood meal. And she could assess whether or not there was a relationship between the abundance of adults looking for a blood meal and the coverage of gat traps in people's backyard. So within each of these circles, this is about the, the, um, the area at which one of these professional uh, mosquito traps attracts flying ad uh, adult females into it. And she could see what was the proportion of households with gat traps in each one of these sampling sites. And she found that in areas or sites where there was over 80% of households deploying these traps, you got significantly less adult females flying around looking for a blood meal. So it was successful. Now, overall, just under half of all the households in University Park were distributed a GAT trap. Right? She couldn't ground truth whether or not those households were actually deploying them, but based upon distribution data, she knew the GAT coverage or could estimate the GAT coverage in each of these 18 sites. So that was really good news, right? And this was published in the journal Scientific Reports. And it's really one of the first rigorous studies to show that a truly citizen-led program could significantly reduce mosquitoes. So with that in mind, Aubrey came along in 2020. She had a few questions that she wanted to ask. The first one was, uh, was whether or not the relationship between GAT coverage, that is the proportion of households deploying GAT traps, and adult female abundances, those flying around looking for blood meals. Uh, what was that relationship in 2021, four years after the program started? Right? Do we still see the trend that Dina saw back in 2017? And then what are some of the demographic 
environmental knowledge, attitudes, and practice variables that predict household GAT deployment. You know, who are the people that are really deploying GAT tracks? If we know that information, then we might be able to tailor education outreach to try and target those households that aren't deploying GAT tracks. So with that in mind, Aubrey really used a three-pronged approach. Uh, she conducted adult female trapping, like what Dina did using these tracks. She used the same 18 sites as in 2017. And these attracted, as I said, host-seeking or biting females. She developed an online questionnaire, deployed it through Qualtrics. Um, and this was really informed by prior interviews and tested rigorously. And this would gather data or predictors of GAT deployment at the household level. And then she also did environmental yard surveys where she was able to confirm whether or not self-reported GAT deployment was actually real and ground truth did. I won't go into too much detail on these methods, but, um, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about them offline. So what were some of the results that Aubrey found? Well, firstly, she found that um, just under 25% or a quarter of households were deploying GAT tracks, right? Um, so this was uh, significantly less or substantially less than the 46 households that were distributed GAT traps back in 2017. So there was a bit of an erosion in overall GAT deployment in the four years since the program started. Of those 130 households that did say that they were deploying GAT traps, um, only about 34% of them had adopted those GAT traps back in 2017, the majority of which had actually adopted them since then. So some people were, were taking on GAT traps and deploying them since the start of the program, which is somewhat good news. And then the big question is, are the GAT traps working, right? And so, the, so it was good news, and uh, Aubrey did find a significant relationship here. So here, just on this graph, I've got GAT coverage, and this is really proportion of households deploying GAT traps. This is the uh, abundance of adult female Asian tiger mosquito per trap night. Aubrey used the same trapping sites as what was used back in 2017, and she found this nice negative relationship, right? In areas where more households were deploying GAT traps, she saw lower abundances of adult mosquitoes flying around biting people. And she tested this just using general linear mix models, and she also included various random variables to control for that variation. Mm -hmm. She also found some interesting relationships with environmental variables. She found that uh, trapping sites that bordered town green space had fewer adult mosquitoes circulating, uh, which was a little bit, we didn't quite expect that. And uh, we didn't expect that because a lot of residents thought that the green space within University Park was a source of adult mosquitoes. We actually saw uh, lower abundances than sites bordering that green space. But we did find more mosquitoes in sites bordering the Central Creek, which was also a little bit counterintuitive. The Asian tiger mosquito doesn't utilize running water to develop its offspring. So it wouldn't be using the creek as a developmental site. But we think that there could be higher abundances of mosquitoes near the creek because it's a little bit cooler, very good resting sites for adults, and there could be trash that accumulates there that does fill with rainwater and does provide habitat. Now, what Aubrey also wanted to find out was relationships really between demographics, these environmental variables, knowledge and attitudes related to household GAT deployment. So this is quite a busy slide. I'll try and walk uh, our way through it, if I can remember what Aubrey did. But again, she used generalized linear mix models and she kind of used a stepwise approach where all the variables in red uh, passed an initial univariate screening and were added to multivariate models. And then 
she uh, used a step backward stepwise procedure where she removed the most least significant variable from the model until the model lost fit. Um, and she was ultimately testing whether or not these variables were, were related to household GAT deployment in a binomial model. She also looked to see whether or not demographic and environmental variables were related to knowledge and attitudes. Now, the variables that are bolded and underlined were significantly related to household GAT deployment in the final multivariate model. So these were the key predictors that really stood out as being important in predicting whether or not households were deploying traps. So there were five of them in total, which were kind of really interesting. The first one was household income. She found that middle income households, that was households that earned between $100,000 and $200,000 per year, were less likely to deploy GAT traps. And we think that's because maybe those households tended to be the busiest households. They could maybe have dual income earners. They really weren't likely to deploy GAT traps. She also found a negative relationship between uh, town green space and GAT deployment. A positive relationship between GAT deployment and time outdoors, right? People that self-reported spending more time outdoors were more likely to deploy GAT traps. People that were more knowledgeable about mosquitoes were more likely to deploy GAT trap. And also people that had a more favorable attitude towards the program were more likely to deploy a trap. I won't go into details on exactly how Aubrey measured these, but happy to talk about that offline. Aubrey also looked to see whether or not these two uh, variables, these predictors, which were knowledge and attitudes, were themselves predicted by demographics and environmental variables. So the first one was looking at knowledge. And essentially, she found that really one variable stood out, ownership status. She found that those people that owned their own residence really tended to have higher knowledge about the Asian tiger mosquito. Essentially, uh, this was related to a question in the survey instrument, which said that um, that asked the respondent to name the most common mosquito in University Park. And if they could say the Asian tiger mosquito, tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, we deemed that answer as correct. And then the other um, attitude question, which was really important, was just the attitude that residents had to the overall program. And essentially, we're asking residents to score their favorability towards the program on a scale. And we found that three uh, variables were really key predictors. So interestingly, households with children in them had um, a poorer attitude towards the program, right? For whatever reason. We're, we're not entirely sure why. Um, Maybe they're just busy. They have other things on their mind. Uh, maybe they're just not as favorable towards those pesky um, volunteer block captains. And then those residents that reported doing more yard activities had a more favorable attitude. And uh, long-term residents in University Park had a more favorable attitude. We tended to find residents that had spent a lot of time in University Park were really gung-ho about the, the program, right? They were really backing the program. They also tended to be a little bit older, and they tended to have more time on their hands too. Okay, so all of this data was really interesting. And, uh, but what does that mean? And so we can kind of start to hypothesize what some of these tre trends may mean. But firstly, I think it's really clear that GAT traps are still effective, right? So really good news here. A relatively affordable trap can lead to area-wide reductions of the Asian tiger mosquito. Uh, we saw erosion of household GAT deployment, and it's still a threat to control, right? So it was down from 46% of households into just over 24%. All right, so we really need continued community engagement. Since 2017, 
you know, that engagement wasn't quite as strong, right? It had waned a little bit. Uh, so uh, maybe if we continue community engagement and increase it a little bit more, we would see the proportion of households purchasing and deploying GAT traps as being a little bit higher. So some other take home messages that we think we can glean from the data is that we want to educate residents through public events and media. Right? And we really want to target types of households with lower deployment rates that we saw in the data. So these were households with middle incomes, maybe those uh, that are the busiest, uh, further from town green space, maybe those residents that viewed green space as a source of mosquitoes were a little less motivated to put out traps. And in fact, their data showed that actually areas further away from the green space tended to have more mosquitoes. So we may want to really target residents that live further away from green space. Uh, target residents closer to the Central Creek, right? We found that that was a hot spot for mosquitoes. And residents who spend less time outdoors, right? We kind of want to get into people's homes. Those people that don't spend a lot of time outdoors, how do we engage them? Uh, we, we want to engage them somehow. We also want to promote the success of GATS, right? Uh, to increase favorable perceptions. We found that people with favorable perceptions of the program were more likely to deploy the traps. We know the traps work. So we want to really improve the perception of households with children. So maybe these events where there's children, we want to promote our program. Newer residents, right? We want to give them some media. As soon as you arrive in University Park, you get some media telling you about the Asian tiger mosquito and how to control it. And residents that do fewer yard activities, right? Somehow we may want to think about how we target those residents. And we also want to educate those residents about the Asian tiger mosquito, right? We know that knowledge is really important. Uh, especially for newer residents, maybe residents coming from outside the region, they may not realize just how pesky the Asian tiger mosquito can be once they're on their front porch or backyard trying to do a barbecue. Okay, so with that, how do we put that in practice? So we're still thinking about that, and this is actually the focus of some current research. Uh, we, we may want to show some data on adult reductions. That may really resonate with some residents, maybe not all. Not everybody enjoys looking at data. Uh, but showing sticky cards of dead mosquitoes can really motivate residents, right? Those little sticky cards, that can motivate them. We want to promote the tiger mosquito as a common enemy. Right? You look at some of the films back in the 1940s. Well, it was pretty full on. We may want to go quite as militaristic as they were back then, but think of the tiger mosquito as a common relatable enemy. And also promote hands-on biology. We do some of this work in Baltimore, where we're getting kids to ferret around, finding trash, looking for mosquitoes. We can do the same thing in University Park. Who doesn't want pesky little kids in their backyard, right? <laughs> and this develops lasting connections. Right. Ultimately, though, our message is that everybody needs science and science needs everybody. So I think with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hopefully you've enjoyed or been motivated by combining research with extension outreach and education. And if you live in University Park, and I can see a few University Park people here, maybe we'll be in your backyard looking for mosquitoes, ferreting around all your containers next summer, if we weren't in there this summer. All right. Thank you very much. We have some time for, uh, for questions. And I should have mentioned at the beginning, we, we have a hard stop at 10 minutes until the hour of the semester since there's a class coming in behind us. Questions back to you? Yeah, David. Thanks. To what degree can you really unravel presence of gap traps and all of the ferreting around that the same homeowners probably did to get all their mm. small little water sources yeah. finished. Well, we did. Uh, 
during our environmental yard surveys, we also measured numbers of water holding containers and whether or not they had larvae in them. And we included that in our models to control for that variation. So we passed that out. And I may not have mentioned that on one of the slides. There was a random variable that we put in the model there. Do you recall the, um, to the degree that, for instance, the play out cat traps are really good at removing those things as well from your yard? Did they, or is it you did the gap to the whole package? Or did some people just do the gap? The yeah, the so uh, with the gap traps comes a lot of education material, and a lot of it is focused on source reduction, right? Just deploying the gap trap on its own without source reduction won't work. With that said, in practice, we found a lot of people just deploying the gap trap without doing any source reduction. Um, both in terms of self-reported, they would often say, no, I don't even bother cleaning up. And also as reflected through the numbers of containers in their backyard. So we were able to, to kind of hopefully pass out that effect of source reduction uh, from the data. Uh, Annie, yeah. I'm curious, how long do these birds live? How far do they mm. travel? Yeah. Effective. Now, I apologize, I should have said this. This Asian tiger mosquito, the tiger mosquito, really only flies a very short distance, often only 10, 20 meters from where it emerged. It can fly upwards of about 50 to 70 meters, which is why when those traps that we put out there to trap the adults, we look at a 75 meter radius. Um, so, so when it comes to management, if you control containers in your backyard and you convince your immediate neighbors to control them, that should be sufficient to really see a measurable reduction. Um, yeah. Marty? I'm a self confessed part of the attrition between 2017 and 2021. So, so uh, I have two of these under my desk, but they're not deployed currently. Um, but I'm, 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 because kind of, I'm, so I'm wondering what what is what about motivation? What do you, what do you got for students for motivation? For, um, this because there's always this sort of in the back of your mind here. Are my neighbors really doing this? Is this going to have yeah. any effect? Um, because you know, even I'm, though I'm doing all of this, I'm not really sure that my neighbors are doing this. You were so motivated. You built that elevated porch in the back. I am so motivated. I put a screen gazebo on the back of my house. That's how I, that's how I escaped the mosquitoes at this point. And, and that's a really good question. And, and so this is uh, where we're at working with extension professionals and, and um, collaborators over in anthropology and sociology. What motivates people to change their behavior or keep up a behavior? You know, it may be creating competitions, incentivizing it, peer pressure, uh, trying to create social norms. Um, and it may not, yeah, shaming, uh, having yard inspections. I don't know if you, uh, well, I can't recall if University Park has yard inspections or not. Some homeowners associations do. Uh, in Greenbelt, in the cooperative, we do, and we're trying to put uh, mosquito habitat as part of the criteria to to regulate or I don't know shame residents because that's what we're like in Greenbelt. Like <laughs> but I, I it may not be a one size fits all. I think it really comes down to the particular community and how that may motivate people. Yeah. Travis. So eighty percent of the community seems to be a good value, but what is yeah. a community? from a sense of a spatial scale, is it yeah. a neighborhood block <laughs> and how much variation is that? Like? It's a magical 80%. <laughs> so, so that 80% was replicated over in uh, Puerto Rico and there our property sizes were smaller. I went back and had a look smaller than the typical university park section or parcel size. Uh, and then the University Park also got to their 80% threshold. So there could be a little bit of wiggle room. Like 80% of University Park or 80% of the neighborhood? 80% of the households. Okay. So then you come into, well, how big is a household parcel, right? Because 
if you're in all town homes with relatively small parcels, maybe you don't need 80%, maybe you only need 60% because one gap trap could really service multiple backyards, right? Because they're much more closed in together, smaller spatial area. Whereas if you live in, goodness knows where, Bowie with large sections, maybe you really need 100% of households deploying gat traps and many more traps. So that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Cassie. Um, two, I guess, small quick questions. Uh, one, where did you exactly place the town green space? Because I live in College Heights Estate, which is just north of University Park, yeah. and there's the Guilford Forest just yeah. over there. And, and, and there's also the park uh, by Wells Run. Right. Did you only count the park there? Um, to the southeast of townish, or also the forest uh, um, adjacent to it. I don't know how um, much borders it exactly. Yeah. And my other one is: um, Did you factor in stream flow of that creek? Because in my and mm -hmm. and and experience of walking my dogs, um, that creek tends to tends to stay pretty shallow mm -hmm. or very slow moving. At times when there's water in it, but I could be wrong, and I'm just curious if, if that was um, considered as a as another uh, random variable yeah. model in addition to just that rainfall. Right, and I, I'm happy to expand on this later. I know time's an issue. Right. Very quickly, I don't think Aubrey included um, where you're talking about uh, University Estates, is it, uh, or University Park oh, Estates? Okay. I think it was just. Oh, right. The University Park. Um, and then secondly, we didn't take into account stream flow or anything like that. Yeah. But I, I can talk to you in more detail offline. Yeah, let's All right. thank Dr. Lisa. Thanks very much. All right. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Great.